Hey everybody, it's Steve and Chelsea Scott with Connect Up, your companion study to come follow me. Hi you guys. Welcome to today's lesson. Today's lesson is Come Back to Christ. We're doing the books of 2 Nephi, 2 Nephi 11 through 19, March, oh we're going into March, March 3rd almost. The chapters that we are so excited to study the most out of the Book of Mormon. You, right? you know what's funny, people will be like, I've read the Book of Mormon, that means 1 Nephi, skip 2 Nephi and on. Raise your hand if that was you. Come on you guys, raise your hand, I know. Hand down. I know some of you, like me. Ah, guilty! But it's okay, it's okay. We love the Book of Mormon and we're excited to teach you. So welcome, I want to say that too. We love you, we're so grateful for you. We're grateful for the likes, the shares, the, the subscriptions. We are so grateful that you're in our class today. So come and join us. Let's have some fun learning about Isaiah today. Shout out time to the McIntyres from Coots, Alberta, who we met in the temple. You guys are so cute. They were so funny. They're like, on Thursdays, it's the Steve and Chelsea show. They made us kind of <laughs> laugh. We bumped into them at the temple. We One. love you guys. Thank you. So here is your official Steve and Chelsea fist bump. Boom. And your high five. Boom. And your heart. We love you. Guys, grab your scriptures, your journals, and your scripture markers. It's time for us to connect up. Here we go. We're jumping into the book of Isaiah. Ooh, dreaded Isaiah. If this is your first time in studying Isaiah, it can get kind of complicated sometimes. You might be like, oh, I don't know what to do. Okay, you guys, it is a different language. Like, it's, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Come on. It is a harder scripture block to understand. And it does take work and effort in understanding what he's trying to say because it's a totally different time, culture, centuries, even before Lehi, you know? So there's a lot there. And so I feel like we can give ourselves some grace and not knowing. But let's teach you a little bit more. So this is what I got to help myself. You guys know who David Ridges is? Apparently he worked for CES for 35 years. He's an amazing guy. So I got this from the bookstore, the eldest bookstore, because I was like, I, I need help, okay? <laughs> It's okay to need some help with Isaiah. And it's been so helpful. So as we go through today, I'm going to read some of the stuff out of this book. So go get it if you need help with Isaiah. This is a wonderful resource. So let's look at Isaiah for just a second. Let's look at the facts of he writes about culture. He writes a lot about culture. He likes a lot about like the culture of like farming and you know agriculture and symbolism and kings and you know, political circumstances of the day. He writes about those in his writings. His writings are very poetic, not to mention the symbolism that he writes with. And in those moments, what we're going to do today in our lesson, as Chelsea has an idea. I do have an idea. <clears throat> okay. I want you to understand this. Today's lesson is not, if you look at today's lesson, it's going to be really simple because Chelsea and I are going to have a conversation with you about Isaiah and the pattern in Isaiah. This is super cool, so I want to share this, okay? It says chapter 12, 13, and 14 go together. Also note that of the 433 verses of Isaiah quoted in the Book of Mormon, over half of them are given differently than the King's J King James Bible. While about 200 of them are the same, see 2 Nephi 2, thus the Book of Mormon is a major source of clarification and help for understanding Isaiah. Um, this chapter, 2 Nephi 12, is similar to Isaiah 2 in the Bible. It deals with the gathering of Israel to the true church in the last days and the millennium and the destruction of the proud and the wicked at the second coming. And what I loved about this was that there's so much clarification in the Book of Mormon about Isaiah because there's so much lost in translation in the Bible. So it's actually clarification. I love this. One of my most favorite classes at BYU when I was doing classes there was the writings of Isaiah by Brother Bell. And I loved it. I come home every day and Chelsea's like, what? And I'm like, this is so amazing. And I geek out over it. Now, today's lesson isn't going to be a super scholarly approach. If you if you want Taylor and Tyler, maybe go look. And we let them. You know, go go, go listen to Tyler. Like he knows what he's very scholarly. They are. Okay. What we're going to do is I'm going to keep it really simple. Y'all know that's the key for me is I'm going to keep it simple. And I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna to share the message of Isaiah in this conversation in this way. Isaiah's message is the same message that all the prophets and Jesus Christ have given. There's a pattern. There's a pattern. It is this. Same pattern. Here's Isaiah's message. No matter what we read, here is the message. Flee from wickedness. Repent. Choose Jesus. 
repeat. Okay. I mean, where have we heard these things before? It's Maybe like over and Nehi, over and over again in the Nephi, scriptures. Nephi, Moroni, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Acts, and <laughs> Romans. Like we've read it all. This is the message of Isaiah. It's just written in a different way. Yeah, and it's different, a different culture, a different time, and it's really amazing when you start getting it. So. Spend some time in Isaiah, you guys, and get some resources to help you. Okay, so we're going to start in chapter 11. I'm going to get my googly glasses out because my eyes feel tired today. Um, but we're going to read, let's go to chapter 11. We're just going to have a conversation. Yes, okay? please. So let's go to chapter 11. Let's read why Nephi included so many. I mean, I don't think Nephi wrote it like a book report. Be like, what else can I add in there? I don't have any artificial intelligence to do it for me. I should probably copy everything out of the brass plates. No. <laughs> Here's what Nephi says. Yeah. Okay, you ready? Go to chapter 11, verse 4. Behold, my soul delights, delighteth in proving unto my people the truth of the coming of Christ. For for this end hath the law of Moses been given, and all things which have been given of God from the beginning of the world unto man are the typifying of him. And also my soul delighteth in the covenants of the Lord, which he hath made to our fathers. Yea, my soul delighteth in his grace, in his justice, and power, and mercy, in the great and eternal plan of deliverance from death. My soul delighteth in proving unto the people that saved Christ should come, all men should perish. For if there be no Christ, there be no God, and if there be no God, we are not. For there could have been no creation, but there is a God, and he is Christ, and he cometh in the fullness of his time. And so now he writes the words of Isaiah to prove to his people the coming of Christ and the covenants that he made. That makes sense, doesn't it? Totally. I mean, and I think uh, maybe that's not true. But what? obviously, me. What part's not true? No, no, the part that's not true is in my mind. I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's true. I know. I'm like I'm talking to my brain when it's come. These are things are going back and forth. Um, Nephi understood Isaiah. His brothers, not so much. So I was kind of thinking, like, well, they must have known. The, the language and the Absolutely. cultural things 100%. more so than us, but his brothers didn't understand it either. Well, I know this. Isaiah would not understand artificial intelligence, things like Facebook, hashtags, you know, fist bumps, hearts, and high fives. Like, he'd yeah. probably be like, what, what? what are they talking about? <laughs> but he did see our day, which was kind of okay. cool. So, Nephi's going to write this message and it's going to go as flee wickedness repent choose jesus repeat who is nephi right nephi right? will write oh. the words of isaiah and it will just oh, gotcha. that's the message so let's go to chapter 12. Yes. what'd you learn in chapter 12. you go first okay i love chapter 12 because nephi or isaiah speaks symbolically about the mountain of the lord which if you read here okay um Let's get my glasses on, shall we? Okay. <laughs> Verse 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days when the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountain. What's the mountain of the Lord's house? The temple. Okay. Did you know what the name for Utah is? Top of the mountains? No. Do you know that? No. So follow along if it says this. <laughs> when the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. Hmm. Interesting, right? Cool. And... And, sh all, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come, ye, and let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So he's saying this. He's like, repent, choose Jesus. Come, like, come to the covenants of the Lord. In the last days people will flow to the mountain of the Lord's house, where how many temples have been announced right now? And you'll say this, but here's the cool part. This is Steve that I just think is cool and nerdy. And he shall judge among all nations, this is verse 4, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And you'd be like, what the heck does that mean? There will be peace. Yeah, he takes, when we, when we repent, and when we go and make covenants, and we go to the mountain of the Lord, we take our weapons of destruction and they become weapons of production. Um, we change. It's like we throw away our weapons of war and have no more desire to do evil but to do good continually. Mm -hmm. That's what that scripture means. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about the joy that comes from the gathering too and helping people make covenants and, and bringing them to the Savior and being that, that instrument for the Lord. Our son who's in England, 
is teaching this man from, is he South Africa? I think he's from Africa. Um, but he's, anyways, he's such a wonderful man and they really connected and bonded and our son's been out, he has nine more months left, but he's been out for a while and he's been searching for that special person that he's like really um, connected with on his mission and this is the man and he is now getting baptized. And I just feel like the joy, the joy that comes from helping people find the Savior and helping them understand who the Savior is and then making and keeping those sacred covenants with the Savior and the, and the, the baptismal covenant is just the beginning. There's so many beautiful covenants that we make with the Lord in the temple that's absolutely foundational to our faith and changes our lives. So it's just, it's so awesome. I just love it. So Isaiah teaches to come to the mountain of the Lord. And then in verse 5, he says, O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. For ye have all gone astray, every one to his wickedness. So now Isaiah goes to the wickedness. Um, and he says this, like verse 8, the land is full of idols. Um, verse 9, the mean man boweth not down, and the great man humbleth himself not. Verse 10, O ye wicked ones. Um, verse 11, and it shall come to pass that the lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness, that's not H-O-T-T-Y, by the way, that's haughtiness, means arrogance and pride of men shall be bowed down. So you'll notice this is like, all of this, he's like, Isaiah teaches, he's like, Pride, wickedness, pride, wickedness. Turn to Jesus and to his covenants. Hard, not hard-hearted, right? Like, the hard-hearted, not willing to listen, not willing to follow, not willing to repent, not not willing to notice the signs, the sign of our Savior, that he's there for us, and the atonement actually is a real thing and can heal our lives. And, can. and Isaiah also calls out the hypocrites. He calls out those who try to, like, they pretend, like, they're doing the work, right? Mm -hmm. So if you go to chapter 13 and look in verse 9, okay? okay. You want to read that? Chapter 13, verse 9. Do you yes. have that in your little book? I do. Chapter 13, verse 9. And he that's, said unto me... That's not it. Oh? It's right there. Okay, read it. You okay, read it. <laughs> I'm like looking at yours and I'm like, that's not even it the is. same scriptures. Verse 9? Yeah. Is that not it? I don't know what book you're reading. Let's oh, go. this is Alma. Okay, so he, he pulls in all this other stuff. Okay, here we go. Chapter go. 13, verse 9. The show of their countenance yes. doth witness against them, and doth declare their sin to be even as Sodom, and they cannot hide it. Woe unto their souls, for they have re rewarded evil unto themselves. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Like they're so sinful that they can't you can't even hide the sin. Like it's just all out there. Have you ever had like one of your children or someone walk in and you're like, What's going on? Yeah. Have you ever seen someone who has left the covenants and their countenance gives them away? Like it gives them away. Instead of light, there's there's none the light has gone. It has dimmed. And then the total opposite, right? When someone yes. has struggled and um, they haven't had the gospel, and then the gospel illuminates their soul, like their countenance just starts to glow and shine from the love and the light of the Savior. Like it's so beautiful to behold. But there is a distinct difference. And in case you were confused, Isaiah gives you lots of details <laughs> on, on the wickedness that you could choose. Um, like, I love verse 16, okay, chapter 13, verse 16, and he says this, Moreover, the Lord saith, because of the daughters of Zion, or Hotty, again, not H-O-T-T-Y, um, and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, not wanton, wanton, that means lustful eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tinkling with their feet. That sounds so weird, doesn't it? Tinkle, tinkle. Well, it's the sound of clicking heels. You know, ah, click, 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 right? Okay, this is the fun one too. Um, there, therefore, the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. In that day, he will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments and their calls and round tires like the moon. <laughs> Does it sound like some earrings people wear? Yeah, those like... <laughs> you got those on today? Oh, they're not oh, quite like, like round way. tires. Those are like baby tires. Um, the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers. The veils. That's weird. What's a muffler? It's a veil. 
Oh, or a scarf. Chains, necklaces, mufflers. Oh, I thought it was like like a car park like a where veil. they where they like took like a real muffler and wrapped it around their neck. So I mean, That'd these are weird. all details that you know. But here's the okay. part. I, again, Isaiah's doing what? Showing them about their wickedness. This like you can't hide it. Focusing on the wrong things, right? Like this this stuff doesn't matter, right? The Savior is the one that matters. Then how come we're getting caught up over here when it's the Savior that matters? So the message, flee from wickedness and repent. Even in chapter thir the end of chapter, um, he, he invites them to repent. You want to share? Okay. I'll read the second. Um, so go to chapter 14. Chapter I 14. did study this a lot for like two weeks. Yeah. And I want to just say that I feel that I have really, for once, understood Isaiah. And I feel a deep gratitude and love for Isaiah, actually. I feel like he was a prophet at the time who was called to um, do something hard. The Lord asked him to go and tell people that they were being wicked and that they needed to repent. And there was a lot of evil and a lot of wickedness at that time. Mm. And he was a dad with young children and talks about that too. Um, he wasn't like this old gray beard guy like he wasn't. Gandalf the gray. I mean, it would have been fine <laughs> if he was. And so understanding this, his language and how, what he's saying just really connected me to Isaiah. So that's why I was grateful. And so I would like, I'm going to add when I want to, but kind of feel like a Ch little bit when like Chelsea, I'm learning still. When Chelsea, when Chelsea and I came and we prepared this lesson, I said, so what did you learn? And the most profound thing is, she said, this is, this is what I learned. It's Isaiah's message. Flee wickedness, repent, choose Jesus, and then repeat. And I was like, well, let's teach that part. Simplicity, the let's simplicity Let's teach, teach it. And the pattern in the scriptures. The pattern is there again and again. And I think it's there to help re us remind, remind us that we can get caught up in pride. We can get caught up in those things that don't matter. And again, repent, choose the Savior. Um, Isaiah teaches again in chapter 15. Chapter 15, I've titled The Song of the Vineyard. It's like this really poetic um, chapter where he, he teaches some really amazing things about, um, about well, if you know agriculture, the song, song of the vineyard to really think. Look in verse 1 and 2. And then I'll sing, a so uh, sing to my well-beloved the song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard in a very fruitful hill, and he fenced it, and he gathered stones out the stones thereof, and planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and made a wine press that it, and looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. Now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard. What could I have done more to my vineyard that I have not done to it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, it brought forth wild grapes. And the Lord's saying, Listen, you're, yeah, Israel, you're the vineyard. And I did everything. like cast out the stones and built a wall. And, and you were doing so good. And now what am I supposed to do? Like you, you, you're not there. Mm -hmm. um, in this book, he's saying, it causes the reader, because Isaiah is a master at incre like of this, in creating this intrigue and interest uh, in this story, in this cultural setting. And, but what he's saying is, it causes us like some exas exasperation or kind of like, what? it's kind of even frustration with the people of Judah, right? But he says, we would do well to look into the mirror and make sure that the person we see does not fall into similar foolishness and wickedness. So you can see it over there in the story. And you're like, why won't they choose the Savior? Why are they doing that? And like, just what are you doing personally that's not choosing the Savior, right? What, what is your favorite little sin that you're holding on to? You know, or maybe something that you're struggling with, right? And seeing, looking in the mirror and asking yourself this question, what do I need to stop doing so I can become closer to the Savior? Because in wickedness, like, we're teaching a lot of you who are in your later years, too, who have gone through this pattern over, like, repeated this pattern. And now you're at the part where you're like, no, I choose Jesus, and I'm going to repent. And But 
like wickedness is anything that would keep us from keep us from living be returning with our father in heaven the need, we all need Jesus Christ on a daily basis yeah. and Isaiah's teachings although complex are the same message in a different tone language or writing style right mm -hmm. choose Jesus repent and choose Jesus and, and it can be anything that's getting in the way anything that's getting in the way of your connection so what part of my life do I need to change Take a real self-evaluation look at your own spiritual compass. And, you know, when I coach people, when I do life coaching for people and I work with people, nine times out of ten, when I start coaching them, their spiritual compass or their spiritual reserves are low. Yeah. Like, they come to me and they're like, I need help. And I'm like, let's talk spirituality. They'll say, I want to I want to work on business or financial things or communication or my relationship. I'm like... Where's your spirituality? Oh, it's like a 2 out of 10. Okay, let's start there. Right? Mm -hmm. That's the message. All right, I'm going to turn some time over to you. I was thinking... I, I lost my train of thought, though, so... As you were talking, I was listening to you for saying... Oh. Shoot, I don't know. I have to keep going. Okay. I don't know at this moment. You guys, the funny part is this, is when Chelsea and I were prepping this lesson, Chelsea has so much to add. I like, did it a second ago, and I seriously can't remember. So, but it was something about the part of, like, what do I need to change? Um, oh, yeah. Elder Uchtdorf, I was listening to him this morning. Um, things that matter most. And he's talking about um, being a, air, a pilot, and when there's turbulence, you know, he's like, some younger pilots will be like, like, the faster you go, like, the less turbulence. You know, he's like, but the reality is, is when you slow down, there's there's that less turbulence. So even though your 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 life might be in turbulence and there might be lots going on in your life, it was such a wise thing what he was saying is just like slowing yourself down. And this is like the focusing on the things that matter most. Are you slowing? Are you just like in the busyness of just going, going, doing, doing? Are you slowing down and you're taking that time with the Lord? And these are these deep questions you need to ask yourself. When you're praying and you're connecting to the Savior and asking the Spirit to be with you as you do your studying, what do I need to change? What part of my life do I need to change and repent? And it can be something very small, and it can even be like very even, it could be a sarcasm. It could be like that very, just like, you're just maybe you're a little too sarcastic, you know, and that causes some hurt feelings, or, you know, it could be something little like that. There's that talk about like clean your room. Start with cleaning your room, you know, and just that will start this domino effect in your life of the different things that you need to work on, so we can grow and we can expand and peel off these layers to be more, become more like the Savior. But we cannot do that do that in the busyness of life. We have to slow down. We have to get quiet. We have to listen, so the Spirit can teach us. That's important. What would you say? Um, from the words of I, like the writings of Isaiah to the person who completely always has fallen on their face like their spiritual face like they face plant they're always making those decisions like what would you tell them to that person who's like always seems to be struggling like remember you shared that with me at this yeah yeah um, I, I would tell them that the Savior loves them and in chapter 19, Isaiah is just kind of talking about um, all the wickedness and all the things that are going on in at this time. And let's go there. Chapter 19, verse 11. We're going to take we're going to take the, the last part, actually, verse 12. The last part of verse 12. Chapter 19, verse 12. So he's talking about the, the Syrians before on the east and the Philistines behind on the west, and they shall devour Israel with an open mouth because of their wickedness, right? For all this, his anger is not turned away. Like, it, as much wickedness and things that you might be doing wrong or, or if you're struggling in any way, we could like just bring this back home to like me personally. Um, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is still, is stretched out still. The Lord will let you repent. 
if you'll turn to him like that's the gift of the atonement is repenting and then and then it says that again in 17 therefore the lord shall have no joy in their young men neither shall have mercy on the fatherless and widows um for every one of them is a hypocrite and an evil do doer and every mouth speaketh folly for this all for all this his anger is not turned away but his hand is stretched out still like he's still there and, I, and then he says it again in 21 manasseh ephraim and ephraim and manasseh they together shall be against judah for all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. You could, just reading these verses, and in their in the Jewish culture, saying things three times is like, pay attention to this. And there's so much love and so much mercy from our Savior that he has for us. And the question is, are you allowing that into your heart? Are you allowing the Savior in? Are you allowing yourself to feel his love? Because that's pretty much the only thing that will motivate you to repent, is understanding how much you're loved and letting his love into your heart and knowing that you are, you are so loved and you have this gift from the Savior. He is merciful. He is all-knowing. He understands your struggles. He knows that you're trying. He knows that you're falling over again. He knows you're making mistakes. And there's never a point when he's like, okay, you're done. Like, let's pull the lever. <laughs> let's just get rid of you here. Like, how wicked these, these people were. He's like, my hands, like, can you see his hands? Like, his hands are reached out. Like, the ones that have the nail holes in them, like, that he died for us, those hands. Can you see his hands? They're stretched out still for you. He loves you. And he has so much mercy for you. You can change and you can heal your life through the atonement of our Savior, Jesus Christ. You can do it. Can you go to chapter 18? Um, let's look in verse 13. Okay, chapter 18, verse 13. Then we're going to go to 19, verse 6. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him be your dread. Now go to verse chapter 19, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The message of Isaiah and the message of all prophets is come unto Christ. Flee wickedness, repent through the atonement of Jesus Christ, and repeat. It's, I don't know, I think of all the people I've worked with in my life who are like, no one loves me, like, I'm too bad, like I've gone too far. There's no one, in the words of Elder Holland, like there's no one who's sunk deep enough that the light of the atonement cannot find them, shine on them. And that's the message of Isaiah. And he repeated it over. Choose Christ. Come back. Repent. Don't, don't do that. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't worship idols. Don't, don't be immoral. Like, come back. Come back. And that's the message we want to share with you. And some of you might be watching me and like, I, I'm doing really good. Careful. <laughs> um, and then there's others who are like, I'm not good enough. I think there is an epidemic right now amongst Christian or Latter-day Saints that believe that they are not good enough for the blessings of the gospel. Like, they're not good enough. I ask the question at the end of every temple interview, do you consider yourself worthy to enter into the Lord's house and participate in temple ordinances? And without fail, like nine times out of 10 or 9.5 times out of 10, the person I interview will say, well, I'm not perfect, but I'm trying. And I, was, I always repeat, you'll notice this question does not say, do you consider yourself perfect? That was not the question. But it is worthiness through Jesus Christ. And that epidemic of, of feeling worthless rather than worthy it's not the message of Christ. You are worthy. You can be worthy. Please come back and be worthy. And that message is for everyone. Yeah. 
So every year I have a vision board and I spend hours on it. Like, what do I want to create? What do I want to feel? Um, who are my mentors? Like, what do I want to do? Where do I want to travel? What kind of experiences and fun do I want to have? And I've been really focused on it. I've been doing it for 20 years. And um, the last two years have been very interesting because last year's was focus only on the Savior. Don't focus on any other mentors, any other amazing speakers and whatever personal development people focus only on the Savior. And I only had pictures of him and quotes from him. And I looked at the vision board every day and I reminded myself of my goals. And this year, um, my vision board has only a few pictures. And one of them is a picture of, it symbolizes me learning from the Savior. And the phrase is, Christ is the Prince of Peace. And he is the Prince of Peace. And that was my word for the year was peace. I want to feel more peace, the Prince of Peace. And his name shall be called Wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. And that's why I really appreciated this as in this Isaiah's writings that the savior is the prince of peace. If you're looking for peace, he is the one you're looking for. Go to him, repent, soften your heart, be humble, be willing to let go of the things that you need to let go of and allow the atonement to heal you. Choose the Savior, allow His love into your heart. Allow it, allow it to light up your mind, your heart, your whole body, your whole soul. And He will help you. He's the one. He's the one that can heal you. Make and keep sacred covenants. They are so foundational. They will help you in every way, give you godly power to move forward in your life and help you every step of the way because life can get hard, right? We can do life with the Savior. We can do this thing and it, we can do it with Him. So I'm gonna leave you that testimony that the Savior is the Prince of Peace. He loves you. You are worthy. Come back. The word of the week this week. I think I'm gonna tell you to repent, okay? <laughs> repent, I think it's a great word. In the Tongan language, it is fakadamala which makes it sound like you should repent. But um, I love the word repentance. So let's repent, shall we, this week. Turn away from wickedness, repent, and choose Jesus. Um, so uh, don't forget to write that word in the comment section down below. Don't forget to like, share this video, and subscribe if you have not done so. We will see you next week when we do come follow me. Have a great week, you guys. Love you, bye!